so there are two scenarios here in Stonewall's sword. There is a sort of main battle scenario where it's covering the time from when Banks starts his attack. And there's also a full a full battle scenario, uh, starting a little earlier, ending a little later, uh, giving you a little bit more room to maneuver and such not. So I want to take that. Now, in the actual battle, this part was basically a desultory artillery um, exchange between the two sides. Um, there are a whole bunch of special scenario rules like to cover the bombardments and stuff uh, before the game starts doing some casualties to kind of randomize things if you play the shorter scenario which is probably more applicable um, you know for like playing at a uh, in in some kind of tourney type situation or something where time is limited or you know most people don't have a great deal of time to get sit together and, and play something even with a buddy these days for whatever reason but anyway since my buddy is always with me um hi camera uh, we have a couple special scenario rules uh, one of them is the starting and ending turn which isn't much the other one is um the forno and trimble brigades over here are restricted to not move until the Jackson CIC enters the game or they're released. Um, they can be released if the Union enters anything in the 2900 hex row, i.e. if they're actually being threatened. Uh, beginning with the next phase after release, they're eligible to be activated normally. If the And they can't be activated at all? No, they can't move, so they could uh, fire their artillery. If the UL, uh, division activation shit has already been played on the current turn, put it back into the cup immediately and proceed normally. The Latimer and Terry artillery units may issue fire com combat normally from the start of the game, but may not move at all until Jackson enters the game, uh, or the divisions are uh, the division is released as above. Okay, so we're pretty much ready to start, and the first thing we do is we're going to see that cup and we should see how that's done each player is first going to choose one of their <coughs> um, special events well let's pick the confederates first command confusion play the union's orders step before any union fatigue and after the Union announces a brigade order, you can kind of cancel it. And you might uh, get a different effect there. Firefight. When it's drawn or held to be played at the start of a chip pull phase, uh, it allows Confederate infantry in one hex to issue fire combat. That doesn't sound too interesting too far away. Jackson's Rusty Sword. This is a unique event if the Jackson CIC is in the game. We don't want to use that. Quick March. We can play this at the start of a Confederate movement. It increases the movement uh, factor by 50%, but there's going to be a roll for stragglers, which could end up uh, flipping a counter. Rebel Yell. You can select a friendly hex and move every Confederate infantry unit in that hex uh, up to one hex in any direction, but they must end next to a, a Union occupied hex. That's not going to help. Union fatigue. You roll a die for stragglers. Uh, I have to wait until a quick march is rolled. So my feeling is either command confusion or, and unfortunately I, don't have, I haven't picked my dice yet, either command confusion or the union fatigue makes the most sense. So I'm going to pick a command confusion. And I throw that in the cup. Now, for the... Uh, We'll be doing that with the Union, too. 
Um, but we should have six remaining chits. Two, four, six. And they all will be shuffled together and basically two of them aren't going to be used. So let me roll a die for which two I'm not going to use. And they'll be used other turns. They're just out for this turn. So these two, uh, I'll put them up here for now. And these guys, without knowing what they are, go in. Likewise, I do the same for the Union. And we'll look at theirs. Brigade Reserve unit Movement. The chip must be played uh, upon being drawn. Uh, select any one group of units on the map or all from the same brigade and adjacent to each other. And they can move up to four movement points. They use Road March but may not engage. While that sounds really pleasing, all units selected must be adjacent to one another and from the same brigade before moving. I'm not sure I want to march that far yet, but uh, command confusion, I could screw up with the Confederates, confident. I played in close combat for a unit that just got a retreat and or sent a rebel unit to the broken track that just achieved a retreat. Um, after the close combat, I choose a friendly unit that has a morale hit marker immediately removed. Sounds neat. Firefight, uh, I get to shoot some more. Quick March, same as the Confederate, and Rebel Fatigue, same as the Union Fatigue. Well, the only one that's of any interest to me is the Brigade Reserve Movement. Chances are the rest of these are gonna get used as with the Confederates. Uh, and maybe even the one I picked for the, hey, let's go find our commander marker because we're early in the battle this one this one will sit out most of these kind of work best when you're actually in engagement okay so then the final thing we do is we put uh, the rest of the events in we did that and then we put all the eligible divisional commands in which I've sorted out here and we throw the two extra in. I've got all the divisional commanders here. Uh, there's no real place to put them to store who's activated, who's not. It just They have to be someplace where both players can kind of see them. And now we're going to push on to the artillery phase. And I'm going to take a little bit of a break. So the problem is that the Union kind of has a reason to launch an earlier attack than they did historically that's okay um and that may be another reason you don't want to do the full scenario because there's nothing really to restrict them all right so we go on to artillery fire and here we just pick up artillery units and start plinking away i guess um i don't know who goes first the union gets the first shot okay so we'll fire one of these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I think I've got. Oh, I'm not sure I have line of sight. It's going to be obscured if I do it from here. Uh, looks like I got a lot of obscuring because I'm at the same level as this. So let me look at my line of sight, but I don't think that gun can see much of anything. The gun is at a lower level. Uh, intervening at the same level as the firing unit or higher than the firing unit and lower than the target uh, woods or units cause obscured the cornfield's not going to obscure things so one two three four let's see I wish I had a longer item you know it actually looks like I'm not obscured So nine hexes. Dampness here. I think I had my cup there. Oh, my pipe maybe. Nine hexes. This is a rifled cannon. Well, that's not right. Nine hexes is gonna put me in the long range. So I have 50% firepower. I need dice, damn it.
I need two different colors. And part of me. All right, we'll use these clear dice. We'll see. We'll see how the this one works. Uh, nine dice. Uh, I'm sorry. Nine nine points or nine hexes. Uh, that's going to be a three point fire. Do I have any modifiers? Well, I don't think he's in the woods the way that's drawn. This is the obscured firing over woods, firing over unit. Are other things going to shoot at this? Well, if they are, they're not going to be shooting through this hex side, and I'm shooting or through any hex side other than this one. Uh, so we're not going to see any converging fire. So I think I'm just on the three table. Make a quick roll. I'll use this as my tens because it's nice and high. No, <laughs> 64. So I get a result, and the defender has to choose a lead unit. He's got one with a four, that would probably have been the one he chose, which means we'll be in the four to six range, which is green. Green says I'm going to be making a routine check and roll again. I get a disorder and an R1. Okay. So the guns push back with a disorder marker. And now the Confederates get to fire. And this stack, which has been kind of chewed up, probably wants to shoot next. Although maybe I want to shoot with this stack. Because this isn't going to get shot again by this, and this might be my best fire because I think I run over the cornfield if I go here. So we'll go over with these. I got three shots. Um, I'm shooting over the cornfield. That doesn't actually have any effect, though. It doesn't obscure. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine hexes. A mix of rifle and smooth bore. Two of the strength points are smooth bore uh, out at nine hexes is long range. That's one strength point. The rifled is also at long range. That's a half strength point, so I'm only on the one table there. No mods. 32 is not going to be an effect. Now, I should be rotating counters or something to indicate that they fired. Unfortunately, that's going to be kind of uh, tricky to recall um, as because I've got units faced for some reason. <laughs> I should unface them. Uh, so, I guess what the Union wants to do is they want to fire another one from back here. Ten hexes. Those are smoothbore guns, which are not going to be as good. That's going to be extreme range. Twenty-five percent of six sounds like it's going to be the one table. Remember, you round down after all calculations, and that's not going to do anything. <laughs> um. Well, it looks like the, the Union is going to keep pounding on these. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This is even lower than this. This, I think, is high. I don't know. This looks low. I don't think I can see anything from here. I think these guns are in a valley. Uh, so I guess I don't really need to fire from there. <clears throat> I should fire these guys instead then. Twelve hexes and a three and a two. Uh, yeah, that's going to be extreme range for either one. And it looks like we're looking at three quarters and a half 
So I've got a one combined there. So far. If I get below a one, I'm on the cadre table. Okay, if the unit's lousy, it would have to make a morale check, but it's not that bad. We'll mark them. Okay, like I said, these guns are out. This one can fire though. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's six smooth bore. Uh, out of range ten, that's going to be a quarter at this one strength point. Nope. And we'll just continue on. I've got a couple more shots up on the hill here, etc. They're unlikely to do anything. Much played out the artillery. Uh, the Confederates just moved this one. The Union has another action. I fired this guy. I didn't mark him. Um, and they still have the cav available. So the cav gets to move if it wishes. Or you could fire if it wanted. Uh, I believe it has 10 movement points. I gotta find where its special rules are kind of hidden though. I know it's got some special rules. Under the artillery fire. It has 10 movement points. It does not receive brigade orders. It can use road march along pikes even though it's not technically under maneuver. Okay. So, pikes under march column is a half. So I spend a half. I can't march column here. I can't even use road movement here. So I've got some kind of slope. I don't know what. I don't know if I'm going up one or two levels there. I think it's just one. So that's going to be an upslope, two and a half, three and a half, four, five, six, I just want to keep it close. I don't really want to be in with that. And it gets rotated too to remind me that I've moved it. Oh. What's kind of hard is with all the infantry and everything, it's going to be tough to see what has actually moved and what hasn't. Here I have some artillery that I could move. Unfortunately, it's in the road here. Where's moving artillery? It's going to cost three movement points to uh, move the ha uh, hex through the woods. That's near the road going around this unit, but I don't see its movement point allowance Is that Be helpful to have somewhere as a node. I don't know All right, I'm gonna have to find that I'm not sure if this is good or bad There's so much bold in the text that I knew to look for the movement points in bold just like you know, I would here but, um, and it helps, you know, find <coughs> the key element you're looking at, but there's so much of it that it was hard to see. It's over here, five movement points here. Always use road column rate on pikes so long as they can stack. Well, three, four, I don't think I can stack into here. And I can't go into this woods hex. So I guess I'm kind of stopping here. Eh. Let's go here. And I think that's the end of the units, the artillery and cav. So I'm going to rotate them all back. And I'll probably just face everything in one direction from each side because once I start using counter rotation. I do want to still keep them kind of facing in opposition to each other as if we were actually sitting across the table from one another. 
And that puts us to the chit draw phase. Then we'll start pulling chits, but I gotta do some more. Turns out I have something loading. So, if uh, we can do a chit pull or two here, probably. All right, it's a rebel yell. Now, I picked this correctly as a player in that I didn't get to, I don't know, I picked it incorrectly in that I got to see what it was. But, um, Normally, you'd want to expose only this side to see which player it was. And there's, as usual, an indentation on the back, and it's raised on the front, so it's fairly easy to detect that. Uh, that would be playing with the normal option that I would prefer for this. Either way, though, I've got the Rebel Yell. I'm going to play this over on the Where is General Jackson track. I don't expect the Confederates to be hitting the Union at any point. And that was just an event. And we can draw again. And this time we do it correctly. And the Confederates peak. And what do I have? Jackson's rusty sword. I believe this one required Jackson be uh, in the game to use this. So we'll put this also on the go find Jackson table. Oh, and they're supposed to go in this box. <laughs> And I did shake these. The Union has a general, and you can see I have all the different brigades listed on here to make it easier to find. I've got, oh, I'm sorry, Confederates have a general. Look blue, you know. It's going to be Winder. Now, Winder's command is over here. I can activate either uh, Talia Farrell or Garnett. Wait. Talia Farrow? It can't be Talia Farrow who has a restriction on uh, No, Trimble. Okay. That makes sense, but I'm wondering if I misspoke. Uh, I'm going to give them a maneuver order. But which one? Oh, I also have Ronald, who I believe is not on the board yet. He comes in down here. Okay. So it doesn't really matter which one I choose. I'll move Talia Farrow. I'm going to give him orders. And do we have a list of the different orders here somewhere? Brigade order details. Uh, I'm going to give him maneuver orders, which is six movement. And we have a quick cheat sheet that gives all the different abilities that you have with each order level. Um, this allows me the road movement, obviously, which may not actually be... In, in marked there. Okay. Woods cost infantry two. I can use road movement one, two, three. Is this a double slope? Is it a single? I think it's just a single. Two, three, down slope. Doesn't cost. Four. Five, six. Let's try this guy. Two, four, five. And there, two, I guess four, five, two, three, four, five. And I'll leave one there. Oh, I'll push the rifles down instead of the smooth bore. You can see I'm trying to be careful with the stacking. I don't really have to worry about rotating these guys. That's Talia Farrow. He's been activated. The chit goes back in the cup and we shake it up. I draw as a Fortunes of War, which is going to cancel the next chit. I needed to light my pipe. I was planning on doing a few activations in there rather than do it all on camera. And a Yule activation is going to get blown. Yule's commanders are Forno, Trimble, and Early. There's not a whole hell of a lot I can do with any of them. I'll blow tr uh, Forno, and that's without him being able to do anything. And these go aside. Yule goes back in the cup because he still has commanders available here. Where is Early? Oh, Early's over here. Interesting. <laughs> Uh, 
So the Union has a Command Confusion chip. That might be worth playing. You hold this until a Confederate order is stopped. And I can play this to screw with a brigade. Alternatively, I could try to bring Ricketts in with more bonuses. I'm choosing not to. I thought I threw one. Huh. Our next chit, find General Jackson. Command confusion on the Union. I'm more interested in bringing Jackson into play. Although, this may have been my pick. But I'm not really worried about screwing up the Union to advance at this point. A quick march. You must flip one FR unit that is going to move to its BW side. That's on a one or a two. Uh, I'm going to hold on to this as well. And we're going to take a little pause here. I'm over in the cup. Ah, uh, because I just heard my stuff finished process. Myself in a mistake. I forgot to make a roll to see if Talafiero. God, <coughs> excuse me. Got all, uh, got a full activation. We'll forget about that and just say he did. The reason I noticed was, hey, Banks doesn't have a number on him. What's up with that? Yeah. Uh, so as CIC, I can direct basically any one force to move for the Union. I've gone through a number of activations and mainly pulling some event chits that I'm throwing in here. Um, I could use the quick march. Which seems like a good idea, uh, just to make sure I end up getting it. I don't know why I held on to the command confusion. So I'll play this quick march here. These can go over here as the unused. And uh, I just select one unit to take stragglers. I have to kind of figure out what my plan is here how I want to begin my engagement. Um, I think what I want to do... See, it's kind of dangerous to try to outflank here because the Trimble and Forno uh, become available. So I think I want to kind of weight my attack in this direction. Just because of the situation. And then, you know, it's kind of a, a goofy thing. It forces you into the historical as opposed to if the Union chose their initial attack here, maybe these guys would have been slow to react instead. So there would be multiple choices. You know what I haven't bothered to do? I haven't bothered to put out the victory point markers. So I'm going to uh, use some of these <coughs> little bingo chits or whatever. I used in another game recently. Uh, all is lost, same honor, I think. To mark what's important, because they're not marked on the map. I find that kind of disturbing. I wish there was some kind of indication of what's worthwhile. So, these hexes all have some victory point value. And actually, the point value seems to increase as we go this way. So, this is worth 9 points per turn to grab uh, for the Union. On the other hand... The Confederate point value ones are end of the game point uh, sections because they don't collect for each turn. They're different, slightly different types of goals here in play. Uh, again though, I do think I want to focus on trying to get down here. So I'm going to move Crawford. I don't flip him over. He's not uh, expended for this. I'm going to give him a, a movement action and see how far down I can kind of push him in this direction to see if I can get a couple of these cheap victory point hexes. I also get victory point hexes running from 1717 to 3717, uh, which is down here and then across and 18, um, basically the edge of map hexes. So sweeping this way gets me additional points. Uh, these first couple, these are only worth two points per turn. 
but I just want to get more points than the uh, Confederates end the game with. Now they have some big one-time points here. <laughs> might be if I could throw the whole force of my army up to here, I might be able to collect enough points just trying to hang on to that, even though it's got almost no strategic value at all and wouldn't really represent anything that I can imagine having any value. It would just be hard to do, which is kind of goofy. Uh, and speaking about not marking these with stars or something, you know, it's not like this map is some kind of, uh, uh, with the all is lost, save honor map, you could kind of see why there were no stars on it. But this, it's not unappealing, but it's just not, uh, not the kind of thing that, you'd feel like, oh my god, it would be defaced by a star. It looks it looks like the TSR era, uh, maybe even a little less, uh, well, it's more appealing, but maybe a little less professional than the TSR era of uh, SPI. Um, I don't know. <laughs> there is something kind of neat about the way it looks. But anyway, let's get these suckers moving. They have six movement points, can use road movement, Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to use it through this hex with these big units, but uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, there's a distance limit to, there's a distance penalty to using road movement. I got caught up on this in another game, but uh, it had much, much more complex rules, so I wasn't able to remember that when there were so many other things to remember. But it's possible. Hmm. Hmm. Not finding it easy to find things in these rolls at all. Obviously, there's no index, nor there is a table of contents, but that gets me to movement, which is where I'd expect to see that. However, maybe it's stuck under orders, which is not where I'd expect to see it. What I'm looking for is that uh, the march column, 13.5A. Sounds like it is under movement. I just could, here we go. Uh, any other restrictions there? Doesn't look like there's anything. Looks like I can march as close as I want to someone. Okay. <laughs> I just got burned by that in another game. So, one, two, three, four, five, six. Let me see if this first one went. One, two, three, four, five. Let's keep them kind of close together. One. See, I don't know if these are slopes or not. I hate trying to read this kind of thing. So there's a slope here. How is this different from a steep slope? Steep slope is supposed to have two elevation changes. It looks to me like there's only one elevation change here, but I'm not sure. Um, but this is going downward. What about that little stream? Does that mean anything? It's in the middle of a hex. A flowing stream. They cost an extra point to move into. So I think this is my best. One, two, three, four, five, six. Five, six. God knows. This is going up. Uh, I think that's steep. I, no, that's not steep, but it's it's an upslope. So that's plus one. One, two, three, four, five. That's as good as I can do. Now I gotta pick one. Actually, before I actually moved it, I would have had to pick one. I'm gonna take this little wee guy at the back, and on a one or a two, he got hurt, and he did not. So that's that. Banks has been used, so I put them over in the used uh, pile. Next pick is a Union event that has to be played right away 
or not played if you want it for the special event. And I'm going to play it right away. It's a reserve movement. It lets me move a line of units uh, all from the same brigade. For, uh, well, let's see what it says. Uh, with four movement points, minimum of one hex, they can use road mark, but they can't engage. And you can't use the quick mark or march or the union fatigue on them, but you know, I've already used the one. So I'm going to get uh, this next wave started. I want to keep press Prince here and Gary, which, uh, where are these? Augers Command. I want to keep that for kind of the center, and I'm going to hit that second. So I want to get these guys pushing forward as quickly as possible. This movement looks pretty expensive coming out of this crap. Uh, this is going to be like three to get there. So here this is three, four, following the road. That's a little quicker. Um, two, three, four, because it's a slope, I guess. I'm not sure. I, see, I can't understand the term for slope here. Uh, it, that That's part of the problem, is the way that they explain things and express it with the pictures doesn't work for me. But slope in the map, these hexides represent a discernible one level change. Does that mean, I think it means there has to be the little, uh, the little slope symbol to indicate that one level change. Otherwise it wouldn't be there. So this is just gonna cost one, two, and then three, four to go up here. This is a discernible one level change with the hash mark. Otherwise, I don't think it makes any sense. So the slope has to have that little symbol, I guess, is what they're trying to express. Two, three, four will move here. Now, I'm not gonna be able to use that shit with this brigade again, because I've kind of separated them, but hey, it's out for the turn and I'll get a, a command with that brigade uh, to go, so. I'm not showing every single activation simply because there's not a lot going on. I think I'm taking more than enough time as it is chattering away here. What I didn't do before with Winder here, I have to roll a die and I need a one through three to get into fire. Now I ought to be checking, do I have something here uh, that I want to play? The Union hasn't played their Command Confusion yet and I'm not sure how many units really require it. I think I'd rather prevent these guys, so I'm going to play the Command Confusion against the Confederates here. Uh, and let's see, you do it before, uh, I guess before they roll, uh, and you cancel their order. I was going to roll to see if they got a full command, and that was going to be interesting. The activate brigade is under a defend order. Now defend has, I believe, a couple movement allowance. Well, what was that? That was Winder. <laughs> Decided to go for a little fly. Um, so I get two movement points and I can engage but only conduct fire combat and no close combat. Uh, and I'd be able to rally. Now this is Garnett that I was triggering here so he gets flipped over and used. And we'll just push his forces uh, forward, and yeah, we'll go here, uh, to try to intercept the Union forces there. Now Winder's command is completely used, so I can throw him over in the discard pile. Actually, what's not certain to me is whether or not I had to roll anyway, though. So this says he played at the start of the Confederate orders, but before any federal, uh, any fatigue check. Um, yeah. I think, I think I don't have to make the command check to see if he's under full orders. So you got kind of something out of it uh, for whatever value there is for that. So I don't know, but I probably prevented that action from happening. Well, we'll draw another check. And feeling about, and we get a command. It's going to be Yule. Yule only has one commander left early and I don't really want to move early too much. I can't... Okay. Uh, 
him. Let's roll to see if I get a command with Early. And now uh, this is a six. So Early's just going to be standing in place and able to fire, and that's it. And that uses up his last command. And we have all the Union officers left to move. That's uh, that's kind of a a major bonus for them. Now we check here with the range, small arms range goes out maybe to three. So I haven't really been worrying about that at all, but I don't have to. I do have to pay attention to whose command this is. These are both Prince's units here. Um, because they can, they can't engage, but they could conceivably move closer and uh, start engaging in a limited level of fire combat. As skirmishers. I don't think that's a wise idea. I think they're there to screen my artillery. Get up to date a little bit here. Crawford has pushed further and is almost in position to launch an attack at this point. Next turn he'll be able to. All of Augur pretty much failed to move except for Green. I caught myself with Green. I had pulled somewhere in that sequence, not before, the Union Fatigue Marker and I played it on Green. It didn't have an effect. Green was the only one who was active enough to march forward though. I still have a few chits in here. We'll see where they end up. Now after an event got thrown over into here too, um, we got the Fog of War, which is sort of the random situation. We're gonna get an uncontrolled Confederate advance. Well, we have to look up what that means here. Uh, the opposing player to the selected affected side selects an infantry or cav unit that's not currently a Jason to an opposing unit, he may then move this unit one hex closer to the nearest opposing unit. If the selected unit enters or leaves a woods or cornfield, it takes a morale hit, unless it's already disrupted. Well, that sounds good. I'm going to make Garnett here uh, charge forward. I don't think I control the actual movement. The opposing player chooses it. Uh, I am the opposing player, so I can choose that Garnett's going to jump right in here into the hole. And that will give me opportunity for more fire. By the way, in movement I grabbed this hex as well as this one. It's just I swung back up. Um, to control a hex you just have to have been the last to pass through it. be kind of nice to have markers that I could flip to one side or the other, but these help me uh, notate who own, who actually uh, gets the victory points for it, and eh, that seems more important than marking who controls the hex at this time. And we got just a couple more chits left. Well, one more. It's Williams' command ship. All right, he has Gordon left, which is this command here. I'm going to make a roll to activate. There are no events left to be played. He doesn't get an activation, so... His units basically can't do anything. I like the, the mechanisms, the way they interleave here. I'm not sure how accurate they are, you know, in terms of representing the command and control problems, but I always like to see something of this nature in a game. And, you know, by, in, by tweaking the numbers, you can get people more or less active and kind of look at how they worked in the actual battle. And you have to assume that the designer, you know, put a pretty good effort into it. It seems to me that the core system gives you the right tools to do that. I'm not familiar enough with Cedar Mountain to critique, you know, how well he's assessed his leaders for this battle. Um, but yeah, what you have is interesting stuff like, you know, one force just charging forward. You wouldn't want to do that and you wouldn't see that happen in, say, the old SPI game. You wouldn't even see that in a chit pull game. It seems like this has taken chit pull to another level, throwing uh, this activation role in there and also throwing uh, the orders, which aren't as big a deal, but, you know, there's no change of orders type situation like in Musket and Pike, but then throwing in, and I don't think there should be, in, in American Civil War. Units were able to be fairly flexible. Um, by adding the fog of war with units being, you know, sending off charging on their own, at their own will, I think that adds a little bit of flavor. And then the enemy can having event shits. Now, how do those event shits uh, really work? Well, 
To some extent, you're making some weird choices here. There's no question of that. If you think about it, hey, do I want to send somebody for General Jackson or do I want the Union to be more fatigued? That's a kind of weird choice. The kind of choice that I rag on CDGs for having it so far isn't really bugging me here. I think it's kind of cool. But if I think about it too much, yeah, it will probably bother me. Um, on the other hand, my feeling is that there are ones that are just good and you probably want to, you know, hit with the battle fatigue, the units that are probably doing the most and in the, the hardest fighting. Uh, so that all kind of makes sense. I think there are chits that are just better and a poor player may do unreasonable things with them. But I think that sort of the accepted play in the game probably, uh, well, maybe not a poor player because if you really want the Jackson shit in the cup. But I think the sort of accepted thing uh, to do will kind of drive you to making reasonable choices with most of these, I think. Um, some of the others, like being able to force march with your own units um, and, and being able to improve your, your force's ability in combat, well, in, to some extent, if you're expending command resources trying to wake up Jackson, you know, you might have important people. Like, I think it was Hill who walked up. I, I don't remember if it was Hill or you. I get the two confused in this battle. But someone walked up to complain to Jackson about his plans, found him passed out asleep. Wow, wait, maybe I'm thinking Murphy, uh, Spring Hill game that I just played with Hood. Yeah, no, that was with Hood. Uh, somebody walked up to Hood in the middle of the battle. You know, a major, one of his major uh, divisional commanders found him asleep and just kind of wandered away with this, what the hell do I do? The dude's passed out and nobody will let me wake him up. And, you know, obviously wasted a lot of uh, a higher commander's effort there uh, to try to get his attention. And that kind of thing, uh, trying to wake Jackson up, might be an equally uh, difficult problem. Or just find him. Um, so, we are at, I believe, the end turn phase. Which we should see some rules for. This is mainly just mechanical stuff. Uh, I can't find it. There we go. 19. Uh, final held chit play. If anybody has chits left that they have to play. Oh, I didn't have to play the commander in chief right away. Oops. Gordon got played. Um, they can do so. And that could be a really useful holding the commander in chief for a final action at the end of the turn. Union gets their victory points. Here we have to page through because again, these are not on the player aid. Um, so I've got the first two. I get four victory points for that. Hey, we've won the game. We just have to sit there. <laughs> um, and reset brigade activation status markers. That's just flipping all these over. We don't have to worry about doing all that. Update the broken track. If anything had taken damage, it would start shifting down and become more available. Okay. Jackson, Ricketts, and Hill. First, the where is Jackson? Uh, all right, we have to find the optional rule for that. I roll two dice and add them together. I subtract the total number of common event chits added together. Well, there was very little chance of this having an effect, but I threw four common events in there. So I roll at minus four and I gotta get uh, one or less or less than a one. Well, uh, it's not gonna do it. And similarly for the union who threw a couple of chits that they didn't even really have any desire to play. There is some chance here. Uh oh. I think we may have succeeded. Uh, equal to or greater than the game turn marker, there's no effect. It's equal to, there's no effect. Okay. And then with Hill, that happens only uh, if Ricketts forces are starting to arrive. So we're done with that. And then we flip back and find page 19. Prepare for next turn. And we gather the chits together and go through that selection process of, hey, there's one that we want. And then two are pulled out randomly that we didn't get, which I guess I just piled into the discard pile. Um, and 
Then we put all the chits in the cup, etc. So that is a full turn here. We'll push to the 4 p.m. turn and see what more the Union can do. They are hopelessly outnumbered in terms of Banks facing Jackson's whole army. Once our, uh, Pope's army shows up as a whole, or even just Ricketts' uh, extra division, it becomes a harder position uh, for Jackson. He's inherently going to have to fall back uh, if Pope's army is threatening the position. But as it stands, Banks is making this kind of vainglorious attack, which the incredible thing is that it almost succeeded. Uh, and I should have given this all in the intro, but eh, I don't know. It's not like I'm ever co consistent or coherent for that matter. Let's send this up. 